a very important um, revenue agency, the Department of Revenue Services. Um, so while, while, before we get started, I'd like to um, ask my co-chair, if uh, Senator Fonfera, if he has any beginning comments. No? Um, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Uh, no comments. I'm just looking forward to hearing from our good friends at the Department of Revenue Services, and I'm sure we're going to have some pointed questions for them about why we're in such great shape and how long is it going to continue. We'll get your crystal ball out, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Here's to crystal balls. Uh, and Senator, Ranking Member Senator Martin, he's not on either. Okay. So with that, I will pass the um, the mic to uh, Commissioner Bouton. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. My name is Mark Bouton. I'm Commissioner of Department of Revenue Services. It's great to be here. Um, it is snowing outside, so that's new. And uh, I just want to thank and congratulate uh, Representative Horn, uh, Senator Fonfar, of course, Senator Martin, and Representative Cheeseman at having this idea of doing a, this is kind of like a primer in taxes uh, for Connecticut and how we operate, what we collect, what we don't collect, why we collect it. Um, and so today we have presentations from both John Biello, who's our deputy commissioner, and Lou Bakari, who's our chief legal counsel. Um, we'll have a presentation on all uh, 47 taxes. So you're going to be here a while. No, we're not going to do that. I'm just kidding. Um, but it's, uh, I guess it, it sprung out of the idea that oftentimes you as chairs and Ourself, our the leadership team of the agency do get questions, concerns, thoughts from uh, elected officials about um, doing certain things or how things are collected. And oftentimes, uh, people just don't have an opportunity to learn how the agency operates and what the priorities are and and how we uh, collect revenue within Connecticut. So this is really just an opportunity for us to to learn a little bit how we do that. What what, what do we use? Uh, to be able to leverage all of our resources and to bring in the absolute maximum dollar that we can. It is true. We've had uh, Representative Cheeseman a good year last year, a solid year this year. I don't know what the crystal ball says, but we're going to have to uh, keep working very hard at that. So um, you'll have uh, an overview of, of taxes and fees, income tax, sales and use, corporate business, miscellaneous taxes. And also we're going to have a review of some of the new taxes that were uh, implicated uh, or put into place last session. I'll tell you that leading this agency has been an absolute honor for me. We've got six, 700 hardworking, uh, diligent, dedicated employees that show up every day. And it's not a fun job. I am a skunk at a garden party. I couldn't go to any holiday parties the last two years. Uh, but all sincerity, it's difficult and it's complicated. Uh, and particularly that section of our Connecticut general statute. So if we can just help you just a little bit, work your way through it. We'll do that. But we also encourage you just to call us. We're that easy. If you want to come to our facility, you're welcome to do that anytime. And certainly um, we're here to, to be a force multiplier for you to help you make decisions and arrive at the policy decisions that you all make here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Biello. John has been with the agency 30 plus years. Um, he has uh, head, headed up the audit committee, audit uh, division, as well as being our deputy chief. These guys know just about everything there is about taxes. So um, they're gonna be able to help you out with that. And I'll certainly be able here to chip in and pipe in as, as needed, John. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I think, as Commissioner said, and just to reinforce that, we want to be a resource for you. Um, and we're here. The message is that we're here uh, to do that. Um, our counterparts in other states and in, in conversations that Lou and I have had with some of our counterparts, they do this type of a forum annually for their finance committees in their respective states and for uh, incoming freshman legislators as well. We're happy to do something like that. We hope that you find this helpful, and we hope that you uh, find the department helpful, uh, a helpful resource, and we, we hope to continue this, uh, this in the future. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about the agency itself, uh, as Commissioner Bouton said, we administer about 47 tax types uh, in Connecticut. Uh, most of the taxes and fees that we administer are codified in Title 12 of the general statutes. Um, what we thought we would do today is to take you through, walk you through some of the larger tax types that we administer, kind of a primer, kind of a, a taxes 101, so to speak, just to give you some of the background on, on, on some of the things that, uh, that we do at the agency. 
one of the questions that we routinely get, probably on a daily basis, is do we administer property tax? And I'm sure all of you know we do not administer uh, property tax in any way. Um, the fees and, and taxes that we collect, as Commissioner said, we have um, about 600 employees at the agency that collect about $21.5 billion in taxes every year. Um, if someone, any one of you were to ask me uh, how I can sum up our agency, I would tell you that we have the best team in state government that simply gets things done no matter the circumstances. So uh, we do have a great team that works extremely hard uh, to collect the revenue that allows the state to, uh, to produce or to provide all of the goods and services that the state provides. Um, we publish uh, on our website, I, I would ask or, or would suggest that you visit the DRS website for anything at all that you need in terms of research. I think it's important for us to point out uh, all of our statistical reports, all of our annual reports are all published on the DRS website. They contain a whole host of information about all of the taxes that we administer. And I know you all have slide decks in front of you. So right now I'm just turning over to page number four and I'll get started with the personal income tax. And like I said, you know, we, we want this to be conversational and, and just a primer on some of the taxes that we that we uh, administer. So if anybody has questions at any point, we're happy to answer uh, any of them that you may have. But just to get to income tax, uh, the personal income tax is set forth in Chapter 229 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Uh, the department collects about $10 billion per year in revenue from the personal income tax. There are approximately two bill, uh, <laughs> excuse me, two million uh, income tax filers every year. Uh, one of the questions that we regularly get is, how is the tax calculated, and where where does the tax start? So I think it's important for us to talk about that for a second. The starting point for the Connecticut personal income tax is federal adjusted gross income, and what exactly is that? If you if you picture the front page of a federal tax return where you kind of uh, list all of your, your different types of income, your wage income, your, your interest, dividends, capital gains. That's essentially adjusted gross income. There are some very specific deductions, above the line deductions that uh, they're called, uh, such as teacher uh, expenses, uh, contributions to health savings accounts, th things of that nature that are deducted to arrive at federal adjusted gross income. The important thing here is that federal adjusted gross income is before itemized deductions. That's the question we always get. Does the Connecticut income tax include itemized deductions? The answer to that is no. We start with federal adjusted gross income, but Connecticut has some addition and subtraction modifications of its own to arrive at Connecticut adjusted gross income. And that's the figure that's ultimately subject to tax in the state. Um, in terms of filing status, <clears throat> excuse me, generally the filing status for federal purposes is the same filing status uh, for Connecticut purposes. So if an individual files their federal return with a single filing status or a married filing joint filing status, that same filing status carries over to Connecticut uh, for Connecticut purposes. The rates and brackets uh, are generally, there's um, for each filing status, there are several rates and brackets. Uh, ranging from 3% to a top rate of 6.99%, which came into play in 2015. Um, let's see, like, like the federal income tax system, Connecticut system is a pay-as-you-go system. And what I mean by that is that uh, you make payments throughout the year, whether it be through withholding, wage withholding, or quarterly estimated tax payments. Um, if, if the individual is making quarterly estimates, they're essentially estimating what their tax liability is gonna be throughout the year and then splitting that, that payment up and making the payment through the year. Employer withholding, anyone that's a wage earner sees that uh, state tax deduction on the bottom of their paycheck or on the stub of their paycheck. And uh, essentially you're doing the same thing. You're estimating what you're gonna owe at the end of the year and you're having the amounts taken out of your check. And the employer um, provides the, the mechanism uh, to do that. Um, so how, let me talk a little bit about how returns are filed. And the agency has come a long way with uh, with filing. And Phil Susi is here with us in the back, and he's our 
director of operations and she's done a tremendous job with the way that tax returns are filed in Connecticut. There was a time, and I remember this time, I've been with the agency long enough to remember the, the piles and piles and piles of paper tax returns that the agency would, would get and the rows and rows of staff that were opening mail and processing paper. Well, we still process paper, but it's a fraction of what we used to do. Um, right now, about 91% of all our tax returns are filed electronically, a huge cost savings to the state, much more efficient way for taxpayers to file. Um, so we, we are very proud to have that number above 91%, and we are constantly trying to improve that number. We just sent out some, some mailings, uh, some letters to taxpayers who file in paper in the previous filing cycle to remind them of the benefits of, of um, electronic filing. We just introduced, introduced a brand new uh, online filing portal. It's called MyConnect. It went operational with our personal income tax this past September. Taxpayers could, could go, it's free, it's secure, um, and it really is a robust uh, system. It's state-of-the-art. It's used in about 30 other states where taxpayers could come to the DRS website, create an account in MyConnect, file their tax return, make a payment electronically, view their account. The department has the ability to send uh, electronic messages to the taxpayer. The taxpayer also has the ability to make to send electronic questions to us. So it's a great way to communicate with the department, an extremely efficient way. Uh, and, and like I said, tremendous cost savings. Um, in terms of refunds, everybody asks, if I file electronically, when am I going to get my refund? We could usually issue, if all, if all things are correct on the return, we can usually issue a refund on an electronically filed return in about a week or less. Uh, with a paper tax return, because it's so manual and, and labor intensive, usually takes us about eight weeks to get a refund out the door for a paper return. So you can see the benefits of, of the electronic filed returns. Um, let's see. Moving to the earned income tax credit, while we're talking about refunds, we have, uh, as you know, all know, Connecticut has an earned income tax credit in the state. It is currently... Uh, at 30.5% of the federal earned income tax rate, calculated very simply. If the taxpayer claimed a, an earned income tax uh, credit on their federal tax return, they meet all the eligibility requirements, they're also eligible for a Connecticut earned income tax credit. And quite simply, it's 30.5% of whatever that credit was on their federal tax return. Uh, we get about 225,000 claims for the earned income tax credit every year. Uh, we've got a team of people that are at the agency and do, in fact, screen uh, those returns that come through. Our systems have some criteria built into them that screen those returns or those claims as they come in. And I'm proud to say that we approve over 90 percent of all of those returns upon filing. So taxpayers that are in need of the earned income tax credit don't have to wait a tremendously long period of time to get that credit in their hands. This is a refundable credit. Um, there are some that are kicked out by the screening process and we do have to manually review them, but it's like I said, it's a very small number. It's less than 10% of all claims that are made get uh, a, an in-depth review based on the, uh, the, the screening criteria. Um, and, and, and with that review, I, I, I should point out, that our team stops about $10 million of claims each year that are that are that don't meet the eligibility requirements. So our screening process works. It's, uh, it's very robust and, and we're able to get the earned income tax credit into the hands of the people that, that need it and are, are, uh, are eligible for it. Um, property tax credit. So um, in talking about credits on the Connecticut personal income tax, you have to talk about the property tax credit. This is a credit that's been in place for many, many years. It's changed, the thresholds have changed over the years. The amount of the credit has changed over the years. Right now, the maximum credit is $300 and it phases out at certain income levels. One of the nice things that the General Assembly did last session was that it removed some of the, the limitations to the credit. In the past, you had to be 65 or older and claim dependence on your federal return to be eligible and also meet some certain income thresholds. Those, uh, the age uh, requirement and the dependent requirement have been removed, uh, which was nice. 
Um, so those are really the two big credits on the personal income tax return, the earned income tax credit and the property tax credit that I think are, are worthy of mentioning. The last item, and I'm probably get, getting into some Enjoy. dangerous uh, waters here, but the last item that I wanna mention for the personal income tax is telework and the whole issue around telework. And the reason why I mention this is because um, you've heard it, you've heard the issues with telework, particularly with the proliferation of, of uh, remote work and, and, the, and the teleworking environment um, that took place as a result of the pandemic. So let me just give you a little bit of kind of background information on why it's why it's so important. This is probably the most important topic in state and local taxes over the last couple of years. So I'll just mention a little bit. There's some mental gymnastics that you have to go through. It's a complicated issue. And, you know, we're certainly uh, available to talk with anybody who's got some some specific questions. But in general, Connecticut, when you when you think about how the Connecticut income tax works, um, from either a resident perspective or a non-resident perspective, Connecticut is a physical presence state. So what I mean by that is that taxation occurs where the person is in earning income. So in other words, for a Connecticut resident individual, if that resident individual is working at home in Connecticut for a Massachusetts employer, let's say, and that Massachusetts employer uh, requires the individual to come to Massachusetts for two days a week, but they can work at home for three days a week. So the question would be, how would that, how would that in taxation, especially in, here in Connecticut, apply to that individual? Can Mass the state of Massachusetts is similar to Connecticut in that it taxes based on where the person is physically present. Um, so for the days that the individual works in Massachusetts, Massachusetts is certainly going to tax those days. However, on the days that that person works at home in Connecticut, Massachusetts should not tax those days. Those days are Connecticut days and the income is earned here. When the individual goes to file their returns, Massachusetts is gonna tax those two days that where they're physically present in Massachusetts. The state of Connecticut will allow a credit for taxes paid to Massachusetts for those days that, uh, that where the income was earned for that person physically there. So the income is not taxed twice. Real simple, right? Physical presence wherever you're wherever you're 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 working and, and earning that that money. Here's the twist. There's a concept out there that's called the convenience of the employer test. And there are only six states that employ such a test. And essentially what it does is this the states that do employ this reach across state lines and they tax an individual uh, for working at home. So in other words, you don't have to physically be present in that state in order to be taxed. New York state happens to be one of those one of those states. And for years, our residents that commuted into New York for a New York employer, but worked some of the time in Connecticut were taxed by both states. We're taxed by New York and we're taxed by Connecticut because of the difference in, in law. New York is a convenience to the employer state. Connecticut was a physical presence state. In 2019, the General Assembly recognized this um, and it was something that we dealt with at the department for years and years. In 2019, the General Assembly realized, recognized this and provided some relief to, to those taxpayers. And what the law says is that if the other state has a convenience of the employer rule, Connecticut will also employ a similar rule. So, in other, so what happens is if the Connecticut resident employee works part of the time at home, part of the time in New York State, we will give a credit for taxes paid to New York if for the days that the employee works at home in Connecticut for the convenience of the employer. So the, the individual is not taxed twice. So that's kind of a high cut overview of, of that whole issue, which was, uh, was at the forefront for many, many, uh, actually for the last couple of years. Yes, absolutely. So at, at the risk of really confusing the matter generally, I always like specific examples, right? So let's say you got sent home, and John can answer this. Let's say you got sent home from Wall Street to work to, li to live in Greenwich. Don't come in, the office is closed. You got to work here. Now, Connecticut could make an argument that you're living and working in Connecticut and you owe us taxes for living and working in Connecticut. We don't care what the employer says you have to work, you, you owe us. New York would say, no, 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 no. 
even though you're not physically present here in New York, you owe us, we're a New York company, New York employer, we're going to tax you too. So it becomes a very dicey situation uh, in terms of that person that maybe got ordered home or maybe once they started going home, they realized, hey, I can do my job, you know, three days a week here or two days a week in New York. It's, it's a problem. But because the salaries that are paid to many of those jobs there are so high, there is a pretty profound budgetary impact um, when you all are making your deliberations about setting up with OPM your spending plans. So the benefit of the convenience employers for Connecticut is, well, now we do the same thing in New York. So if I live in Danbury and I work in White Plains and I'm a teacher in White Plains, well, they get a credit. And I guess that's not a good example. But the point is that they would be subject to the same rules. Um, However, we've had a lot of people that have raised this issue to us over the last several years, primarily because of the pandemic, primarily because the workplace has changed. People are doing a lot more um, telecommuting. And we don't really have a good answer, except that New York is being a little, little rough, a little abusive uh, in reaching across state lines and, and collecting your money or asking that you pay them too. And they are relentless. They sent out about 150,000 notices last year saying, you owe us. So we spent a lot of time on the phone speaking to residents saying, well, yes, maybe, no, we're not sure. Better talk to your accountant, that kind of thing. Um, difficult, thorny situation. I, I know the governor has been very concerned about it. I've had many conversations with him about it. There was a case that was filed uh, during the pandemic involving New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It got thrown out because Massachusetts got rid of its rule and uh, it was no longer uh, moot for the court. Um, but there's still discussions about what do we do? Because on that exchange, we lose money, right? Because of the, the amount of salaries that are charged either way. Connecticut loses uh, some money because we're offering a credit. So John, did I explain that properly? Yes, I think the important thing to take away from all of that is that it's facts and circumstances driven. That's that's yeah. really what, and it's a you know an individual taxpayer situation. So you really have to look at the facts and circumstance of it. Not easy, complicated, our taxpayers in Connecticut are situated pretty well right now with uh, with Connecticut's uh, convenience test as well, particularly with respect to New York. But again, you really need to look at the facts and circumstances of the situation. So that's what I had for personal income tax. Again, high level overview. Um, happy to take any questions. If there are no questions on the income tax, I certainly want to move to Lou and uh, talk to you a little bit about sales and use tax. Just, just to be clear, I, th I thought what we do for the members of the committee is if you could just save your questions and at, we'll ask them all at the end, because I imagine there will be a fair amount of overlap here. Okay, so great. Thank you. Great. Well, Assuming you're all staying with us. <laughs> thank you. We're not going to be hurt. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as as John had said and the commissioner had said that we, we could spend hours on any one of these topics, right, to really dig in then and, to, and to get into the details and things. But we're hopeful to provide, uh, as we said, hopefully some topical information that can help assist with questions and proposals that, that you folks see during the upcoming uh, session. Um, I also want to make sure there it's important to understand as a backdrop for all of this, right, that, that our entire tax system is based on voluntary compliance, right? It is a voluntary compliance system. So what we view as, as our role and, and why we appreciate an opportunity like this is that we take the laws that are passed and we view it as our primary job is to take that information, the laws that are passed, and put it out in a, in a way that taxpayers can understand, that's easy to understand, that can help them comply. Because the easier it is for them to comply, the better it is for the state of Connecticut. So it's really important to understand that that's what we view our role as taking what can be technical legislative proposals and doing our best to try to put them in language that the, that the taxpayers can understand. Now, understand that that's not always possible, right? Because there are some really complex provisions that may not apply to the to, to taxpayers, uh, the public in general, but understand that that's our role. So again, appreciating an opportunity to be here today, to have that type of discussion, to talk about the principles and concepts in a way that hopefully are understandable to folks. Uh, just a couple of other things to mention too, that uh, confidentiality is always at play is that we're not allowed by statute to talk about specific taxpayers or specific taxpayer situations. So we want to make sure uh, we understand that as well. And finally, tying into what the commissioner and John talked about, the, the figures with the $21.4 That was on our, uh, for fiscal year 20 to 21. 
which is consistent with the most recent annual report that's available. However, good news is fiscal year 21-22's annual report should be out in about a week or so. So there'll be updated numbers for you folks to, to deal with. So with that as backdrop and context, uh, the big four taxes, we've talked income tax, sales tax, corporation, business tax, and the past serenity tax, roughly are 84, 85% of the entire 21.4 billion that you're talking about. So income tax, as John mentioned, was a little over 10 billion. Sales tax in the most recent uh, annual report was about $5.4 billion. So to give it some context, those two taxes alone are $15 uh, billion. So obviously it's a, it's, they're significant revenue generators for the state. And obviously it's important to understand the principles that, that underlie those taxes. So with regard um, to the sales tax, and I think as the slide shows and follows along, we thought it would be helpful to give, uh, give a reference. Uh, the sales and use taxes as actually set forth in chapter 219. So it looks like we have a typo on our slide. So it's actually chapter 219, not 229. That is the income tax. Uh, so apologies for that. And we can certainly send an update it. But it's important to understand everyone, you know, we all pay sales tax, right? So how the heck does this sales tax work? And it's important to understand that it's a transactional tax. So literally at, at a point in time when a retailer makes a sale of whatever it might be, the tax is imposed at that point in time when the sale is made. So in that case, so it's important to understand. So the retailer is the one who's actually responsible for the tax, but the way the statutes are written, it authorizes the retailer to pass that along and recoup the tax from the person who's made or the entity that's making the purchase. So that's important to understand. The tax actually falls on the retailer, but the through Title 12, Chapter 219, this the legislation authorizes the retailer to charge that to the customer to recoup it. So it's important to, to understand that. So when we walk in and whether we buy something, whether it's at a at a restaurant or the hardware store and they charge us tax. It's the retailer, the one that's responsible for the sales tax, but they're allowed to collect that from us. That's important. That's critically important to understand because when that retailer collects your money, our money, when we pay the tax, they're required to hold that money in trust for the benefit of the state of Connecticut. So this gen the, the law says that you're allowed to hold the state's money until the next reporting due date and filing of a return. Most sales tax filers are either monthly filers or quarterly files that makes up the bulk of them. So a retailer literally has the state's money for a month after the retailer collects it or for a quarter. And that is critically important to understand because when we talk about seepage and sales tax and places where things, uh, sales tax having that money and how being reported and filed and problems that might be associated with it, the temptation for retailers to keep that money and not remit it, those are the types of things you might hear about, but that's the structure and that's the system on how the sales tax works. The retailers authorized to hold it, hold it in trust for the state and required to remit it. And, uh, and again, $5.4 billion and uh, it's, it's, it's significant, but it's also important to understand what, when we talk about a transactional tax, what Connecticut sales tax actually applies to. And it's important to understand the distinction it applies to all sales of tangible personal property made in the state of Connecticut, except those that you exempt. So that's this general assembly can decide. So all sales are taxable, except those that you exempt compared to services and listed up there as enumerated services, whereas uh, tangible personal property, all sales, enumerated services, we only tax those services that you deem us required to tax. So they're, they're two different, all tangible personal property, except where you exempt them. Services are only those that you tell us that we can tax. So one, it's important to understand. So that's when you hear a transactional tax, you can have a sale by a retailer of tangible personal property or a sale of services. And, it, and, and only those services that are enumerated as taxable. And there's a, a laundry list, I believe by last count, roughly, I think the state we tax about 70 services, if I, if I often, I probably can get to the exact number and they range in scope, right? And it's important to understand everything from computer and data processing services to business management services, to janitorial services and everything else in between. But again, it's up to this body to, to specifically enumerate which services are taxable. So that's important. And we can provide any sort of, like I said, level of detail. We could talk for hours about any one of these topics. 
and we can certainly provide any detail you'd like in terms we have on our website, as John mentioned, we have a listing of all the enumerated services that the state that the state taxes. Similarly, when I talk about tangible personal property, all tangible personal property, except those sales that you exempt, it's important to note that this body has exempted over 120 different exemptions to sales of tangible personal property. So while it says all sales of tangible personal property, except those that you've specifically exempted, there's a fair number of those exemptions that have come into play as well too. And we can certainly on our website, you know, point in a direction where we list all the items that are exempted, whether they'd be sales to the, to the, to the federal government, whether they'd be safety apparel, whether they would be things like that, that you've exempted from the application, the sales tax. They're clearly tangible personal property, a clear sale is being made, but this body has said that we decided that we're not going to apply our sales tax to those transactions. So it's important, I think, to understand that in terms of services and tangible personal property uh, with, with, uh, with regard to the sales tax. Uh, with regard to um, the, the tax rates that are applicable, I think that's important uh, to cover as well too, to give you a flavor um, that the general sales tax rate is at 6.35%. We have a tax on uh, luxury items, which motor vehicles of a certain price, jewelry, clothing, and footwear of a certain price, the tax rate applicable to those sales is 7.75%. Uh, there's, I mentioned computer and data processing services as one of the services that are enumerated. We do tax. The, we tax that at a straight 1% rate. Uh, so that's a, its own separate rate. We have a rate of 4.5% on sales of motor vehicles to non-resident members of the military. So I think you guys might understand that there are, there are certain, you know, Eastern Connecticut has naval bases and places like that, where if you're, you know, someone who might come in and be stationed there for a while, purchases a car here, that person would be eligible for a reduced rate on the sales tax and the purchase of a motor vehicle. Uh, we have a 9.35% rate on the rental of motor vehicles for 30, ca uh, 30 or less calendar days. And we have a 7.35% tax on meals. And we have a 2.99% sales tax on sales of vessels, motors for vessels, trailers used for transporting vessels, and dyed diesel marine fuel. And one final thing to mention in terms of rates, if you haven't, it's sort of interesting, right? Our sales tax is usually viewed as being simple, but as you can see that there's a whole bunch of rates in there that make it a little more uh, complicated than it might appear uh, on its face, right? Yeah, simple sale, apply the, the rate to the transaction. You got to figure out what's being sold and then determine the rate. It's also important, and I put it up, uh, we put it on our slide, the room occupancy tax where folks realize, you know, when a hotel or lodging house, when that, you see that charge on your bill, that's actually the sales tax. It's not a separately enumerated tax. It is the sales tax just at a 15% rate. And that's applicable. There's also an 11% room occupancy tax rate that's applicable to bed and, back, bed and breakfast. So those are a high level overview of the various rates that are in effect inside chapter 219, uh, which is the, which is the, the sales tax. We, uh, we talked a little bit about the statutory exemption exclusions. I won't rehash that, but we thought it was important to, to touch briefly on the concept on your slides reflected as marketplace facilitators. That gets it online sales. And I think it's important to, to mention that, right? And um, it's the concept of a marketplace facilitator is in statute. And again, as I said, we won't talk about uh, specific taxpayers, but by way of example, if you think of an, a marketplace facilitator, it's an entity that has a forum that sells products for other sailors. So if you think Amazon, right? And you think people who go on and, and, and sell their products through Amazon, what the marketplace facilitator language that this, General Assembly put in place back uh, December 1st of 2018, which I give uh, the General Assembly a lot of credit. We were in the forefront of this because at the time that passed, there was still what was called the physical presence rule. And we can, we can certainly get into that and having a, 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 I'm sorry, a nexus rule, physical nexus rule with the state in order for the sales tax to apply. We, we put this marketplace facilitator legislation in place and that requires the entity that that marketplace facilitator that operates that forum, rather than having multiple sellers, whether or not they have nexus with Connecticut or what, puts the responsibility for the collection or remittance of the sales tax on um, the uh, 
on, on the marketplace facilitator. So again, in my example, uh, Amazon would be required to collect and remit sales tax on all transactions on its platform made to a place that has a Connecticut zip code or address. So it puts the responsibility on one entity, the marketplace facilitator, to collect and remit sales tax on a platform. And I think that was critical and I think it's important. And John can certainly jump in, but I, you know, I think we pat ourselves on the back here. We've done a really good job. We have registered, I believe, over 95 or 6% of the top 500 online retailers are all registered uh, and collecting and remitting sales tax Connecticut. So we are really well positioned as a state with regard to the, the collection and remittance of sales tax on online sales. It, it, that was a, it was a priority and Commissioner Bouton continued that as a priority for us. And we made sure that we are in really, really good shape when it comes. I think John might actually know the numbers and figures yeah, associated with it. It's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, the top 1000, I believe, uh, online retailers. And Lou, Lou mentioned it, you know, can I, we were the department and, and the state were at the forefront of this, even before the Wayfair decision, you'll hear, you know, Wayfair, 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 that was the big recent Supreme Court decision on, um, on Nexus and, and out-of-state retailers. The department was, was way ahead of that. And we were, we were uh, at the forefront of the um, online, uh, having online retailers register and, and begin remitting. We were in negotiations with a lot of the, uh, the bigger ones. And um, to the department's credit, you know, we've got over 90% of the top 1,000, uh, you know, in the country that are that are uh, now registered and, and remitting to us. And as I said, I give this body a, a lot of credit because you guys gave us the legislation that was out in the forefront to, to, to get to those folks, to get to those entities, let them know Connecticut was serious about the application of the sales tax, believe that the old physical presence rules that were really dated didn't apply in the, in, in the e-commerce market. And so Connecticut, like I said, is really well situated when it, when it comes to um, sales tax applying to online sales. Um, so that was really it from a big picture. We, there is still, it's important, it's sales and use taxes. So use tax still is a thing. So if someone goes to another state and buys something and brings it into Connecticut, if you didn't pay sales tax on it there, uh, you are required to pay use tax on it. And just one little plug is that the department makes it easy. And again, with the assistance of the General Assembly, you can actually pay your use tax on your Connecticut income tax return. There is a line right on that that where you can, you know, you can if you owe use tax, you can file it and, and pay it right there. Uh, so it's it's still a thing. Uh, we have information on that and our uh, the instructions to our CT 1040, our income tax return. It gives taxpayers some guidance on that and helps assist them to the extent that they might have questions about whether they owe use tax. So I figured I'd throw that that use tax still is a thing. It's important to pay attention to and we still do as a department pay attention to it from an audit and compliance perspective so uh, thank you that was it from a big picture sales tax perspective i don't know commissioner john i just want to say uh, people often ask me where do you see the biggest loss of taxes or, or failure to collect uh, or challenge to collect by far sales and use tax um, particularly because a small business generally they might be a cash operated business or operate on a cash basis um, reporting is can be difficult uh, if you're not really familiar with business principles or how to do that. Um, restaurants that operate in a lot of cash, right? I think we, we see a lot of that. Um, those are probably where the largest tax gap exists uh, in trying to collect the sales and use tax. Most folks are compliant once we approach them, um, but uh, generally speaking, we see a lot. You, you may even see as you travel across the state uh, in your own hometown. Okay, I think we're gonna move to the next tax type. So um, in terms of the big three, the corporation business tax is next up on the list. And I'll, I'll talk briefly. I know we're, we're um, well into, into the session here and I know you, you've got some questions so I won't spend too, too much time on the corporation business tax. Just a couple of things to mention. It's, it's uh, set forth in chapter 208 of the Connecticut General Statutes. And there are about 36,000 filers that file corporation business tax returns. And we collect about a billion dollars from those uh, from those corporations. It's an annual income tax return or an annual business tax return, I should say. And similar to the personal income tax, there are four quarterly estimates that are required uh, to be made with the corporation business tax return. I'm going to start with two, 2016 because there were some significant changes made in 2016 that I think were uh, were right on and 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 certainly help 
uh, Connecticut corporations. Um, first, uh, the uh, corporate, well, let me step back a little bit. Historically, the Connecticut corporation business tax was always done on a separate filing basis. So in other words, a, a separate individual entity would file a corporation business tax return, even though they may be part of a larger uh, co consolidated or combined group. And beginning in 2016, um, the the uh, statute was changed, and um, this was one of the more important and, and critical changes that were made. And it shifted Connecticut from a separate entity state or separate filing regime to a uh, mandatory unitary combined uh, reporting system. So in other words, like I said, rather than have that, each one of those separate entities file, if they're part of a group of related entities, they can now file on a, on a unitary consolidated basis. One of the other things, or two two other things to mention for 2016, the state also moved away from an old um, methodology of apportionment that used that used three factors. Connecticut is now a single sales factor uh, apportionment, which basically means that you look to where the sales are made, where the customers are located, um, and and again that helps Connecticut businesses because they may have customers located out of state, therefore they're not apportioning those sales uh, to Connecticut. And conversely, a, uh, an out-of-state business that is making sales into Connecticut now apportions those sales and, and are taxable to Connecticut. So 2016, in my opinion, was, uh, was a banner year or a banner time for us, um, which, which we, where we saw some significant uh, changes and, in my opinion, improvements to the, uh, to the corporation business tax. But just um, to talk briefly about how the taxes uh, is calculated, there's really two ways, I would say, to calculate the tax. The liability is really the greater of the, the tax that's calculated on the net income base of the, of the corporation or on the capital base. So the cor a corporation is required to, to look at both of those bases, and we won't get into the weeds on what those two things are. I think net income, the net income base is self-explanatory. But essentially, the tax that's due is the greater of the calculation under those two, two methodologies. And in no event shall the tax be less than $250. So there is a $250 minimum tax for corporations in Connecticut. Now, the rate of tax on the, on the net income base is generally 7.5%. Um, and again, that's measured by net income of, of the entity. Um, there are, similar to the personal income tax, uh, there are modifications that a corporation can make, some additions and subtraction to federal taxable income to arrive at the Connecticut taxable income amount. The capital base tax, <clears throat> excuse me, is calculated at a rate of 3.1 mils. Um, and this is, you know, it, it's complicated. Uh, the capital base tax begins with the average value of a, of a company stock. There are adjustments for surplus reserves and things of that nature to arrive at the at the amount that's subject to the 3.1 mils uh, tax rate. Uh, there are numerous credits that are available, tax credits that are available to corporations. Um, the department publishes a cor a guide to the business tax credit to corporation business tax credits that are that's found on our website, and it provides all the information to companies and and uh, corporations that are doing business here. To, uh, to inform them of those credits that may be available to them. In general, a corporation cannot use more than 50.01% of their tax credits to offset their, their liability. Um, so that's really it on corporation business tax. It's, uh, I just wanted to um, give you a brief overview of some of the highlights with it and, and mention the 2016 year because I thought that was, uh, there were some significant changes made. Um, uh, during that period of time for corporation business taxes. Um, moving on to pass-through entity tax. I thought I got to do this one. Oh, you want to do this one? Oh, absolutely. Happy to. <laughs> okay, so John's going to get into the details of the PET, but let me just, let me give you, I liked my bakery example. <laughs> Nobody else liked it, so I'm going to get We're it. going into business, All right. right? John and I are going to go into business. We're going to, we're going to own a bakery store in Waterbury. And we own the property, we own the building. So the end of the year comes by, July 1, and the good city of Waterbury issues a property tax bill, right? And the property tax bill is $26,000. John and I in that year made $100,000. So we now, under the PET, will be able to 
if we want, deduct the $26,000 from the $100,000 and only claim the difference of $74,000. We would split it up and we can lower our earned income, which basically gives us a break. And by the way, allows us to go above $10,000 on the property tax salt cap that was put in place several years ago. That's the example I always use, but John didn't like it. No, I, I, we're going in the business, remember? I, right, I like we're this. selling donuts. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that allows you to take advantage uh, and pass through uh, some expenses and, and be able to lower your overall um, liability. Now, Governor Lamont has just proposed raising right this uh, number up to 91. 93.0. 90, 93.0 down from 81. So I got a lot of um, questions and emails like, raising taxes on me again i can't believe it this thing's going up. i go no it's going up but you're going down because you're getting a bigger credit so you should be happy if if the legislature opts to to embrace this as part of uh the overall spending package so that's kind of where we're at but it is a complicated tax but it was again forefront it was leading there are states that call us all the time about how did you do it we want to implement a, pro a property uh a pass through exemption tax as well a pet tax so um john if you want to add to that go ahead but we're in business. We're making money. We are. We are. I'm in that property. Yep. So real quick, 122,000 filers, about 1.5 billion uh, collected from the past through entity tax. The tax rate is 6.99%. And this came about, Commissioner is absolutely right. Connecticut was the leader in this. We were the first in the country to pass a pass through entity tax. And tax kind of is a misnomer because it really is an effective vehicle to, um, I'll, I'll say, I'll use the word avoid, the minim, minimize, thank you, Lou, minimize the impact of the uh, state and local tax deduction that was put in place by the Tax Cuts and Job Act several years ago um, under the, the, the Trump administration. What this essentially does, like Commissioner said, it allows the deduction to be had at the business level, therefore reducing the amount of income that the individual members of the pass-through entity recognize and pay tax on. Now you might say, well, if the entity's paying tax and then the individual's paying tax, aren't or isn't the income being taxed twice? No. And that's the credit that commissioner mentioned. The credit is at the individual level. It's it's being proposed now that that credit be restored back to 93.01%. So the income is not taxed on, at both locations. It's a complete wash at 93.01%. So it really will be or or would be revenue neutral if it if it were restored that was the rate in year one of the pass through entity tax and then the credit rate was reduced the following year to 87 and a half percent so that's that's basically it in a nutshell um it really is a uh, was enacted and and as commissioner said it's being enacted throughout or was being enacted throughout the country uh by many states in response to the ten thousand dollar limitation at the on the state and local tax deduction that was in uh, put in place by the uh, tax cuts and job act so that's really it for pass through entities um i don't know anything else you want to mention about our bakery the only thing about the bakery is people always ask me well why can't we get a hundred percent credit on that i said well you can't because you're still going to owe 6.99 right. percent so 6.99 right. percent minus 100 is 93.01 percent so in case they ask you out there just saying Okay, we will uh, now move to some of our miscellaneous taxes, some of our excise taxes. A lot have been in uh, in discussions uh, lately, the motor fuels tax and, and things like that. So I'm going to uh, turn that over to Lou to explain those to you. Thanks, Chuck. I guess, uh, how did I get left out of this business? But that's 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 okay, <laughs> apparently. The, uh, the, uh, to, to talk about, uh, as we mentioned again, context, $21.5 billion in taxes, but there are some other other taxes that I think are have been noteworthy uh, and have you know come into play. And one of those is the, the motor vehicle fuels tax. And we sort of chuckled like it's gotten this label as like Connecticut's gas tax, Connecticut's gas tax. Connecticut really doesn't have a gas tax, right? It's the motor vehicle fuels tax that applies to a whole bunch of fuels that include gasoline and gasohol. So when this body uh, sunset or uh, postponed, or I can't remember the word that we use, temporarily suspended, I think is how it was phrased in terms of, it was the actual motor vehicle fuels tax as it applies to gasoline and gasohol is what was actually suspended. And that was, uh, and that's important to, 
to, to understand because uh, the, the motor vehicle fuels tax still applied to those other fuels, whether it was propane or diesel or things like that, the tax was still applicable. So um, that's the the tax that when you see it's the it was the one that was the basis for the, the tax holiday. It's the motor vehicle fuels tax. Um, as I mentioned, it's also important to note, and I think it's uh, will be interesting. Uh, the motor vehicle fuels tax, as I mentioned, applies to diesel. Instead of the rate that applies to the other gasoline, gasohol, the diesel rate is set separately every year. The commissioner takes the formula that this body prescribed for calculating what the tax rate is on diesel, and he's required to notify you each June 15th of the rate that will take effect July 1st and be applicable. That's done on an annual basis. So this coming June 15th, the commissioner will send you a letter telling you how he's calculated the tax on diesel, and that's the rate that will be effective uh, July 1 through June 30th to run for the, the fiscal year. So that's uh, that's sort of the, um, the motor vehicle fuels tax, again, from a big picture perspective. There is some confusion when uh, I think the, about the which taxes apply. Uh, there's also a petroleum products gross earnings tax, which is also uh, a tax that could apply, as its name suggests, it applies to any product that's a derivative from petroleum. And that is, uh, for purposes of this tax, it's a gross earnings tax that's applicable to the first sale of petroleum products that, that, that takes place in Connecticut. To give some context, to so think of the petroleum products gross earnings tax applying to those companies that bring the product into New Haven Harbor. They make the first sale to, say, a local distributor. That's the first sale in Connecticut that's the petroleum products applicable, that company that brings it in and makes that first sale. Then think about those distributors that I just mentioned who buy that product, then then make the sales, whether it be uh, home heating, whether it be to gas stations, that's where the motor vehicle fuels tax comes into play because those folks would then be that next level, uh, the distributors that are then making the sales to the retail establishment. So hopefully that gives a little flavor of the hierarchy of petroleum products, gross earnings tax, company that brings in, imports the product into Connecticut, makes the first sale subject to the petroleum products gross earnings tax. The entities here, those local distributors that purchase the, those petroleum products, then make those sales. That's where the motor vehicle fuels tax sort of kicks in. So hopefully that helps clear up a little on, on how that works. But I, we felt that that was important given the sensitivity of those issues, just to make sure uh, we gave a little bit of a flavor of what that is. Um, the other thing, Taxes we thought we'd mention just simply uh, because of dollars and volume. The insurance premiums tax, important to understand, brings in a couple hundred million dollars a year. Uh, you might say, why are we targeting insurance companies? Well, it's uh, insurance companies are exempted from the corporation business tax that John talked about, and it imposes uh, uh, its, its own tax on basically the premiums uh, that, th that those companies write. There are a variety of other uh, insurance premiums taxes under that umbrella, just to give you a flavor. So it also applies, so it applies to domestic and foreign insurance companies. Uh, it also applies to healthcare centers, also have uh, premiums tax on, 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 on unauthorized insurance, as well as captive insurance companies. So those all fall under the umbrella when people talk about in, insurance companies or taxes on insurance companies, it's important to note that there are, there are multiple levels and different types that, that apply in that range too. To be, to be mindful of. And we figured as sort of a, a, a segue into the cannabis tax, we'd mentioned the alcoholic beverages tax, the cigarette and tobacco products taxes to make sure, um, again, because they bring in, I believe if I remember correctly, uh, the cigarette tax is over $300 million a year in terms of the taxes that it brings in. It's important to understand that all three of those taxes, alcoholic beverages, cigarette taxes, and tobacco products are wholesale level taxes. So they're imposed at the wholesale level, and ultimately, obviously, at the wholesale level, that the the the, the tax or that the the that the, the the wholesaler incurs is ultimately passed along in the prices that they sell the products for. So, uh, alcoholic beverages tax again wholesale. It, it it the rate is dependent on the type of product that's being sold, whether it's wine, beer, distilled spirits, anything like that will dictate uh, the applicable tax. Cigarette is. Uh, four dollars and 35 cent tax per pack of 20 cigarettes so that's the, the the tax rate on it's kind of interesting that if you factor in this the, the uh, state cigarette tax the federal excise tax and the sales tax you get close to 
uh, $10 worth of taxes on a pack of cigarettes. So it's kind of, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's worth, worth, worth noting uh, to, to, I guess, uh, give some context uh, with that. And the same thing with the tobacco products tax. As a general rule, it's 50% of the wholesale sales price, except when it comes to cigars, the tax is 50 cents on each cigar and snuff products is based on weight, $3 per ounce. So that's it gives you a flavor of, again, of the hierarchy of how those uh, wholesale distributor level taxes uh, work. And with that, we thought it would be, as the commissioner and John mentioned, sort of a segue into the recently enacted taxes and fees. And one of them is the statewide cannabis tax, which uh, it took effect. Uh, the first retail sales were allowed January 10th, so just a couple of weeks ago. And it was, we thought it would be important just to give a topical overview of, and you can see from your slides, there's three different categories of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, material, uh, I guess three different categories that the cannabis tax applies to, retail sales of ca cannabis plant materials, cannabis edible products, and then the sort of catch-all, everything that isn't cannabis plant material and cannabis edible products. And depending on that, there's a different tax rate. So there are three different rates on the statewide cannabis tax. Uh, a separate rate that applies to cannabis plant materials, a separate rate that applies to cannabis edible products, and a separate rate to that separate rate uh, to that catch-all. Um, we wanted to note that on our website, the department's website, we have a landing page that uh, everything you want to know and probably more about the statewide cannabis tax. Uh, we've done our best to try to get answers to commonly asked questions, guidance out there, examples, instructions for retailers on how the tax applies. Uh, so I would highly recommend that if anyone has any questions, take a look there. It's a really good, really good starting point. Uh, but we'll also mention that in addition to the statewide cannabis tax, there is also a municipal level cannabis tax that applies. Uh, and the department plays really a limited role in, in that. And that's a, I think we want to make sure we get that out there. We will collect the returns filed by the entities that make the retail sales. We will send that information to the municipality where the retailer is located and the municipality will bill that cannabis retailer for the tax. So there's gonna be a lot of connection required between the department and the municipalities where these shops are located, where we will share this information with them, which will allow them to collect their municipal level tax. And it's also important to note that the regular 6.35 sales tax that I talked about earlier also applies. So there are three different taxes, the statewide cannabis tax, the municipal cannabis tax, and the regular sales tax. Cannabis is the sale of tangible personal property. Uh, we talked about that earlier. So 6.35% applies to the sale of cannabis. So hopefully that gives a, I know we're talking quickly, but wanted to give some hope for some of those principles. Uh, thanks, Lou. John's going to talk to us about the highway use fee. That's one of the other taxes that we had that's been recently enacted. Yes, thank you. So just quickly on the highway use fee, um, again, that started this January. First uh, 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 trip into Connecticut on January 1st is subject to the uh, highway use fee. It is basically imposed on certain carriers for the, for the privilege of operating or causing to be operated uh, certain heavy multi-unit, that's, that's critical, multi-unit motor vehicles on any highway uh, in the state of Connecticut. Um, the returns are filed monthly for highway use uh, fee. Uh, typically, uh, and in keeping with uh, the filing of other tax type returns, it's due the last day of the month following the monthly reporting period. So in other words, for the month of January, all the activity will be reported on a return that is due and filed the end, by the end of February with us. Uh, the key, and one of the big questions that we get uh, with this is um, is about weights and about the type of vehicle. I operate a, a dump truck or I operate a cement mixer and it's over 26,000 pounds. Therefore, I'm, I'm subject to tax. No, that's not the case. There's another piece to the eligibility requirements. The vehicle has to fall between class eight and 13 of the uh, federal highway use uh, classification system. So in other words, they have to be two unit vehicles, a tractor and then a trailer. Um, if they don't fall within any one, the, the, the class eight through 13, uh, but they're over the weight, they're not subject to the tax. It, it, it's really that simple. And on our website, we actually have an illustration uh, depicting 
the types of vehicles that fall into each each classification. Um, the fee itself, again, is quite simple. It's calculated uh, based on the weight of the vehicle, and that's the loaded weight of the vehicle, um, and the, the, the number of miles driven. And the rate of tax varies between two and a half cents per mile up to 17 and a half cents per mile uh, for any vehicle that's over 80,000 pounds. That's the, the highest rate. Um, and there's a, there's a number of different uh, rates depending on the weight of the vehicle. Like I said, returns are filed uh, on the you know, monthly return. Our systems are all up and ready. Uh, we're, we've been registering taxpayers uh, for several months now. And um, we've been providing uh, this week, this Thursday, we have a webinar that we're doing for the uh, Connecticut Trucking Association. Uh, so we're, our staff is out there and we're uh, reaching out to the, to the industry to help everyone get on board, get registered and understand the fee. So very infancy, uh, uh, but it's uh, so far, everything's going really well with the uh, implementation and the administration of the fee itself. So that's all the material that we had regarding the various tax types. Like I said, uh, we hope you found this useful and um, hope that uh, we can do this again for you. And we're hoping or happy, I should say, to answer any questions that you might have at this point. Thank you. I imagine there are one or two questions, um, but I do want to thank you for, for giving this presentation. I think it's extremely helpful for uh, freshman lawmakers, as you noted, but not just freshmen, all of us uh, who perhaps think we understand an issue, but but it it bears uh, a review of it to make sure that we're all operating more or less on a on a, the same page. And of course, I, I note that you are all very available for questions as well. So I thank you for that. So um, we will take some questions. I will ask let those of you in the room to raise your actual hands, and those uh, on the Zoom call. Um, uh, to raise the hand fund or bring bring uh, yourself to the attention of of uh, Bree or Ash. Um, also, I will try to we will observe the two question limit per legislator. Try not to make them two compound questions. Uh, if we have time, we'll get back. You know, you can get back and and answer ask more questions if you like. So I will start off with two of my own, um, uh, and I want to return to uh, uh, the cross-border transactions, basically the, the between states, as, as I represent a district that is very close to both the New York and Massachusetts border. And I, and I will note that it's not just Manhattan, it's also Poughkeepsie and Millerton, uh, where people, uh, it's very complex for a lot of people. And, and so I guess I, I wanted to know a little bit more about the interpretation of convenience of employer. And, and is it, um, at this point, are New York and Connecticut using more or less the same interpretation? So as to say, when something converts for so in your the example that you cited before, uh, you know, early on in the pandemic, the employer shuts down, and so it really is at the convenience of the employer that you are working at home. At some point, that converts into a choice by the employee, and and I wonder how much of the issue here is about the interpretation of that. I think, uh, Madam Chairman, there is always interpretation um, dissonance that goes on between both states, but it's really how their statute interprets it and how our statute interprets it. And the problem, um, as you cited, uh, for the pandemic, for example, first of all, the word convenience doesn't really explain what the rule is. It's, it's confusing, right? So if I were a sales person living in Connecticut, my territory were Connecticut, Connecticut only, but my business was in New York, then I would be taxed by Connecticut. And I'm not so sure that New York would reach across and try to get that money, right? I wouldn't have to pay two taxes. So you would think that would be convenience, right? I, I, I have to cover Connecticut as my territory. I'm going to live in Connecticut for my convenience, but it doesn't work that way. So that can be confusing. But if you end up getting ordered home because of a pandemic and now the office is back open but you like you said say you know it just makes more sense i, I can hear it can be with the kids for three days a week and two days a week in the office now that is uh maybe the convenience of the employer certainly the inconvenience of the employee and you would be subject to both taxes so it can be really uh frustrating um to learn but interpretation goes on a lot we have tried uh, frankly to reach out to new york to talk to them on multiple occasions about this they're not interested because at the end of the day, they actually in the swap of money, if you can picture that, 
they end up on the plus side, we don't end up on the plus side. We lose money on that uh, particular transaction. Um, so John, I don't know if you want to add any more to that, but yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's, it does come down. It comes down to facts and circumstances, like, like I, I mentioned before, and it depends on um, whether or not the individual is working tel uh, remotely for necessity. Like you said, uh, representative, if they're, if they're, employers shut down and they have to work uh, at, at home for a particular reason, that creates a different scenario. That's out of necessity um, versus convenience. Um, so it depends on facts and circumstances. This is an issue that'll come up upon audit. That's how New York treats it. They audit the individuals that they think this issue applies to. They make an interpretation based on the facts and circumstances and apply the tax um, that they think is appropriate. We would do the same. Um, if we uh, came across the issue upon audit, we would look at it, interpret the facts and circumstances, and then apply um, the tax or, in some situations, a credit for taxes paid uh, to that other jurisdiction, again, based on facts and circumstances. And I'll stick to my self-imposed limit and ask this as a separate question. You mentioned that this has a profound budgetary impact. I wondered if you could quantify that. I mean, I... For me, it's profound. It's been something that the governor's been concerned with. Um, certainly, we've been concerned with, and it depends on how you 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 factor in the numbers. But a, a gross estimate would be around three hundred million dollars a year uh, that we could recoup if we we uh, were operating this rule correctly. But that's only because of the amount of salaries that are going back and across the the border, and it's it's a long fight. I mean, we've looked at working collaboratively with our other states and. They just kind of, they, they're not, New York is definitely not interested in having this conversation. So it's been frustrating for us. Just want to make sure, Representative, that we're clear that when we talk the, to your first question, that our convenience of the employer test in Connecticut is reciprocal. It means it only applies if another state has one. So it doesn't apply across the board. But I think it's important to your question to let folks know from an administrative standpoint or from a tax compliance standpoint, that we would apply the same rules that that state that would be implicated. So in your case, the hypothetical with New York, we would apply New York's rules for purposes of determining the application of our convenience of the employer test to, as John pointed out, the specific facts and circumstances. So I think that's important to get out there. So they look at the guidance for New York would be the guidance that we would follow for purposes of how we would apply it. But the one question where it could come down to is how New York interprets something versus how we interpret something. That's where you might get into the issues. We will apply the same guidance, but we might not necessarily reach the same conclusions. Thank you. I will um, pass the mic to the good ranking member, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And my, my first question is the crystal ball question that I threatened to throw at you before, and I'm not actually going to throw a crystal ball at you. So as, as we, you look at fourth quarter payments coming in, trends you're seeing. Um, I, OPM mentioned in their letter, they're starting to see a decline in the, that pass-through entity tax receipts. So is there anything you can tell us today and what you're seeing that you think is cause for concern? You're going to closely monitor something along those lines? Well, I think we, you know, look, we monitor we re, I receive a report every day on collections and how they're, you know, an actual to actual forecasted expenditures and how they're matching up um, to what we thought we'd collect. I, I would say that um, right now it's more difficult for us to be able to, to give you a sense of where we are, except to look at the trend line, right? The trend, now, remember, we didn't make changes to our tax code. We offered significant tax relief uh, in the last budget. So that's had an impact on our collections this year. So right now, the last revenue consensus forecast had us running at around a billion dollar surplus. Last year, it was $4 billion, right? So that you, you can see that where the trend line is. And that's why I think that, our, frankly, Governor Lamont has been very deliberative and, and thoughtful in his approach uh, as we move forward into what to cut and when to cut it and why to cut it, because you don't want to have to go back and ask for a greater contribution to, to our residents. Um, but I also will tell you that um, we are developing a, an internal uh, bureau, if you will, that'll be able to help you with forecasting. And that's what we call the RAP, which is uh, Revenue Anal Analytics and Forecasting. It's a data-based, data-driven system uh, staffed by about four or five people that we, that was in the last budget that uh, we are currently out advertising for right now and, and getting ready to interview folks. Um, and they'll be able to help, uh, particularly OPM, as they begin to make their strategic decisions, the governor, that team, as well as the legislature, what's going to happen not only next year, but what's going to happen five years down the line. 
or do we have a good handle on that? Can we benchmark ourselves against other states? What are other states doing as it relates to revenue? And um, are we competitive in those areas? One of the questions I get asked every week is, how many people are moving out of Connecticut? And what's that impact to our budget, particularly from obviously lower Fairfield County? I, I can't tell you, you know, we don't ask for that data. So this year, for the first time, we're asking for more data on our forms. Um, to be able to give you the information you need and other agencies the information they need to be able to make decisions. Um, so it is frustrating for us. Um, uh, the governor particularly is interested in the capital gains uh, and, and what the potential losses. Other states are seeing a, a loss in capital gains. They're forecasting it. Um, but our filing system right now, even if we look last year, doesn't really, it's not helpful for us to be able to do that except to benchmark ourselves against what other states are saying. So it's something that we're watching closely um, and we really can't give you any data on that until a little bit later on, but in the future, we will be able to, and it'll be re essentially real-time data for you to be able to make some decisions. Thank you. Well, look, look, look forward to that. I believe you mentioned that new d division last year when we talked. Um, um, I'd be quick on this one because I know other people have questions. Uh, in your other taxes and fees, that includes as cheats that we get from the bottle deposits. We're putting that bottle deposit up. Have you factored that into your forecast? How's that going to play out? We haven't done any forecasting on the, the new the new uh, cost of the AGs. They went from a nickel to a dime, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Cheeseman. Um, next, I want to confirm, is Senator Martin on the line? Does someone want to does he have a question? I, I am, Madam Chair, but I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll, I'll let Vice Chair um, Representative Farrar ask the next. Thank one. you, Madam Chair. Hi, everyone. So thanks for being with us on this snowy afternoon. And thank you for the presentation. It's good to see you all. Um, first off, I, I really appreciate, as was said, not just for us uh, folks that are uh, returning to this role on the finance committee, but also for the new folks that she went so thoroughly through all the taxes and what they are. And I just want to highlight, I think one of the other things that you've done recently in updating the tax incident study is extremely helpful to our committee as well, because it's certainly one thing to put taxes in place, but then how they actually impact our families and our communities is so critical. And so I just, I want to Thank you for that. And you know, we want to keep strengthening that so that we really are making decisions so that all of our residents can thrive. Uh, but my two questions actually are going to get at something you mentioned briefly when you were talking about sales tax, but it is about uh, the tax gap that we know our state faces. And the first question I had on that is, does DRS plan on any sort of tax gap analysis, especially maybe with some of these new staff you're bringing on board so we can more fully understand the scope of the tax gap and again, um, where the greatest need is to focus on getting those taxes that are owed? Um, yes. Um... First of all, the te next tax incident study is due in 11 months. Um, yeah. We also are working on four other studies for the General Assembly. One is almost done, three that are, that are in progress, and we'll have an update for you on those, um, as well as starting the new process for the next tax incident study. And uh, when the RAF is up and running, they'll be able to do that themselves. They'll take that, Great. that body of work and continue to update it, so you'll get it on a much timelier basis for that reason. Um, the tax, there is a tax gap study that was done, I think 2014, right? And uh, maybe John could just update you a little bit on what, what they found. Uh, yes, Representative, there, there, we did do a tax gap study on sales, specifically to, to sales tax back in 2014. We have not updated that uh, since then. Um, I'd have to go back to look at that, to be quite honest with you, to, 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 to answer any type of questions on what the gap looked like at that point. Uh, it's it was substantial. It's it's I mean, you can't sugarcoat it. It's it's I think Lou mentioned it uh, during his uh, presentation that sales taxes is, is difficult. Um, it's difficult uh, from a compliance perspective. Uh, it's a complex tax, which makes it um, difficult for taxpayers to understand at times and, and, and be compliant. So it's not only that taxpayers are trying to be evasive but they just sometimes don't understand it and, and it's difficult for them to, to comply that way. So, um, but like commissioner said, 
we are certainly looking to to um, to look at the gap, especially from a sales tax perspective. Once we have our research and, and analytics unit up 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 and running and staff, that's going to be one of the things that uh, that's on their agenda. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll look forward to updates then on that staffing and certainly strengthening our our tax gap analysis. But the second part to that question for me, and I know we've talked about it a little bit again, again, this kind of significant area of where we could be collecting taxes um, that we are not. and and one of those things is due to, uh, in in many cases, the lack of auditors on our Department of Revenue Services team to go after uh, where taxes are owed, and this these are revenue positive positions certainly because they bring in uh, so many more dollars that our state is owed. So I wanted to ask, uh, does DRS plan on submitting any positions in this upcoming budget to increase the number of auditors? I'll let John walk you through the actual uh, division because uh, he also is uh, head of the bureau chief of the auditing division. But um, I would say a couple of things. One is once we fully embrace a data-driven approach to to auditing, um, we we won't necessarily. I'm not going to say we never can need more help, but we certainly can get by with our current table of organization and do a good job at it and close the tax gap. Right. Um, secondly, um, filling positions, having them appropriate is one thing. Filling them is very difficult right now and you know we've just brought we we've, we've been bringing on employees in batches of 20 to 30 at a time in some cases um and the to go from what an account career trainee an act it's a two-year process and and we you know we do lose people in that process where they just don't want to wait till the very end or it's just too much or it's not what they thought so it, it's a challenge and we do have some follow up from the, from people that we bring on board um, so finding people that are qualified is a challenge um, and also keeping them once we have them there because it's, it's a difficult job. Um, but also, I think that you're on point in the sense that we don't necessarily need more taxes. We just got to maybe work harder, smarter at collecting those taxes. And I think strong algorithms driven by data that's current and timely will help us identify the best areas in which to go and audit and get the greatest return. Um, but uh, we have been staffing up in the audit division with some really terrific people. John is also, like I said, the chief of that division. So I'll let him speak a little bit to the table. And some of the new taxes have gotten auditors, by the way. Yes, thank you. Um, so we just we just recently brought on board, uh, two weeks ago, we brought on 15 additional auditors. Um, and we are planning another class for, we're going to start the recruitment process um, next week for a brand new class that will be hopefully onboarded just after uh, tax day, um, sometime in, in uh, mid to late April. Um, but just to, to give you an idea of where we were at um, before the retirement surge, we were at about, uh, we were staffed at about 235 auditors uh, at the agency. We're at about 194, 195 right now, plus the 15 that are that are that have just come on board with us. So we're getting our numbers back. And as commissioner said, recruitment's difficult. It, 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 there's just no other way to say it. It's it's not easy. Um, and we're out there doing everything we can. We're working with DAS to try some innovative things. Um, I've been out there myself going to some colleges and and uh, trying to recruit uh, uh, prospective uh, employees from right right from the college ranks. Um, but it's not easy. It's it's tough. Um, but what we are doing, in addition to the recruitment and filling the vacancies that we have, we are looking at ourselves. We're looking internally and we're seeing what could we do to improve. I monitor our audit coverage rate constantly. Um, I'm always looking at that. And we've, uh, for example, sales tax, you mentioned the sales tax and how difficult it is in the gap. We're looking at implementing a sales and use tax desk audit program where we're identifying things upon filing. Um, and we're able to, to um, get in contact with that taxpayer right away. And rather than wait to do a full-fledged three-year audit somewhere down the road, and by that time that the problem has compounded itself um, multiple times, we're, we're getting at that right away. So our audit coverage rate is, is, is on the rise. It's, it's, it's increasing because of those types of efforts. We're also doing some education and outreach. We've got our taxpayer service um, division, our director there, and her directive is to, we need to get out there and we need to do more in terms of taxpayer education. We just held 
a webinar, our very first webinar that the agency did um, for new business registrants. We had over 300 people attend this webinar so we can tell them what their filing and, and, and payment obligations are. It was extremely well received. Um, we're doing another one at the end of this uh, this week for highway use fee. So we're doing things like that. We're trying to get out there. We're trying to be a little more visible and uh, make sure that taxpayers have everything that they need to be compliant with, uh, with their obligations. So there's a balance there. There's the enforcement side, which we're doing. We're bringing on, we're bringing on more enforcement officers too, not just the civil side, but we've just hired uh, four uh, sworn police officers for our criminal investigation division that have started under a brand new uh, chief of police that we have at the agency. So we are doing the enforcement side. We're doing things to, to help with, um, with audit coverage rates, but we're also doing the taxpayer service side as well, which I think is equally as important. Thank you. Thank you all for that update. It's very helpful. And again, I hope we can keep strengthening those reporting tax incidents and strengthen our tax gap analysis so we can really make decisions here for all of our residents uh, to do well in our state. So thank you. Thank you to the chair. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I want to note that I didn't mention this at the outset, but we do have a custom, I understand, in this committee of uh, limiting a colloquy to five minutes. If you if you could help us with that in, in the questions between the representatives, I didn't start out with that at the outset, but I know that we do have a hard stop because we have a second meeting in half an hour, so I want to make sure we get everyone's questions in. Um, next, I will call on uh, Representative Carney, and I know Representative Meskers, we see you on Zoom. You'll be up next. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming here. Um, and I, I, I must agree, uh, Connecticut does do a good job at simplifying, uh, especially the income tax process. It is a lot easier than many other states. So good job with that. Um, but my uh, line of questions is regarding the highway use fee. Okay. So my first uh, is simple. How much do you anticipate um, receiving I don't want to say this fiscal year because the fiscal year ends in June, but perhaps when a full fiscal year of collecting this fee is implemented, how much how much do you think you'll raise? I think it was programmed in the budget for 40 million. 40 million. Okay. Right. Close to that, yeah. Um and, and since this is a you know a new fee um I, I guess some of the things you're talking about in terms of you know you'll have to register the weight You'll have to say how many miles. Um, I guess it's sort of a two-parter. Um, number one, how would, I mean, why would somebody comply? I mean, if somebody, why would somebody tell the truth about how much weight is in their truck and how many miles they drive? And if they don't tell the truth, how would you ever know? Uh, that's a great question. So we've had uh, just under 25,000 carriers register from across the nation okay. in Canada. Uh, many of them are used to doing this kind of system, so uh, that won't necessarily be an issue with some of them, but certainly could with others. I think it's first and foremost to remember that uh, all taxes that we have are really based on on faith that you'll actually go and that you'll pay them. Um, but secondly, there's a system, uh, and one of the things we've talked about with the trucking industry is once we get a year under our belt, uh, uh, either designing an app or designing a system that's easier for them to fill out because uh, everybody's going to do a little bit different, you know, whether they carry a, a log in their truck, whether they keep the log in the office. Um, I've seen it done and I attended a conference over the summer where they were doing it on, on a, an app on the phone, which is a lot easier for the driver. So um, there were a lot of different ways to do it, but we want to get feedback from the carriers themselves and say, what's, what's the easiest way for you guys to comply with this thing? Um, so we're waiting to hear back. We want to test it out. Remember, it's almost like it's not beta, but it's sort of like a beta uh, situation. Um, you do risk, um, though, if you don't comply with a whole host of different uh, uh, problems with the state of Connecticut revenue services, specifically a potential audit, uh, an audit of not just your mileage, but your entire business um, and other areas uh, along those lines. There are certain things for enforcement we can do and things that we're prohibited from doing from the Highway uh, Act. Um, so you have we feel confident that we have the tools uh, in the chest to be able to enforce this. Um, we are not going to be doing random stops on the highway, representative or things like that. But on the other hand, um, we're certainly going to share data and information with other states, uh, similar to what IFTA does. So we think that we'll be okay there. But it's um, uh, the threat of audit is, is very strong with a lot of these companies. Um, where I'm concerned is that, and I talked to the, the trucking industry the other day, it's the two, three truck 
operations where the, where the owner's driving one and he's got two others driven by buddies and you know how do you how are you going to track those miles and is everybody going to be reporting correctly and, and that's where you know we're, we're taking feedback from them right now to, to make a better system uh to do this and john i don't know if you want to add a little bit more yeah no the only thing i would add is uh right now um it's data it's all about data and we've we are a data rich agency and we are able to identify those that are registered and those that are not registered or, or in compliance. So we we have a, uh, a robust set of data that we're, our team right now is using to identify those that aren't in compliance. And we're also, I think Commissioner mentioned this, we're in constant communication with our colleagues at DOT and at DMV. Um, we meet with them regularly on um on on data that they have or information that they have as well so we've got a few different compliance uh techniques that we can use okay all right i appreciate i'm sure i'll have more questions regarding this as session goes on and once it gets implemented implemented but i do appreciate your responses it clears a lot of things up thank you representative representative meskers and followed by representative Pilar. thank you very much madam chair can you can you guys hear me Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I want to go back to the convenience of the employer, the tax. And my concern there is, um, is it sounds like two to three hundred million dollars of tax revenues being misdirected or directed to other taxing authorities, other than other than Connecticut. Um, what, what do we see being done away from us in other states on the issue? of day counts versus convenience. And um, assuming that New York is unwilling to compromise or reach an agreement, what are our alternatives? So uh, Representative Mesker, thank you for that uh, question. Um, we are continuing having internal discussions about what the strategy would be uh, as it relates to New York uh, in this thing. It's a very unique uh, position they have us in as it relates, you know, Massachusetts is not a, as a, a physically present state, it's not a convenience employer state. So um, we've got some work to do there. Um, and uh, we've looked at this from a number of different angles. The Supreme Court, um, we're not so sure, may not be interested in this. We think they may um, as being a state's issue, but it's, a lot, it's a big lift to get in front of them, obviously, and to be able to file all the briefs, et cetera. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Lou to see if he's heard anything on the legal front beyond this. I know there's one case that's winding its way to the New York tax courts, um, but there hasn't been any resolution on that right now. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. <clears throat> I think many of you are aware, I don't know if you know Professor Zelinsky, New Haven resident, you may have heard of that. He challenged New York's interpretation application of this back uh, in the early 2000s and lost. He has uh, taken another challenge uh, now in light of uh, the pandemic, in light of the way things change. So the one thing I will say is that it, it may be perhaps worth watching to see the status of his uh, case as it works its way through the New York Department of Taxation and Finance. But um, I, if I were a betting man, New York's New York. They're not going to change their mind on how they've interpreted their provisions. So it will be interesting to see, I think, the commissioner's it. I think there's a lot of internal discussions on what options Connecticut has, and I think that's probably a, a fair way of leaving it. Thank you. Uh, no, Representative Paletta, followed by Representative Bronco, I believe you also have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner. I might be a little biased because the deputy commissioner lives in the best district in Connecticut. And, uh, so, you know, we have a lot in common. Um, well, I will keep my comments very brief and I just have uh, a quick question. Uh, number one, I mean, I, I agree with commissioner Bowen. This is, uh, you're doing a phenomenal job at a job that not anyone, uh, many people don't want to do, right. You have to collect taxes from people. Uh, people always believe that they're overtaxed, uh, a couple of years ago in this uh, committee, I remember making a statement that I, I think you all agree with, and I'll say it again. And that is the fact that we pay uh, a sales tax of 6.35%, but there's so many exemptions on that 6.35%. 
and we're striving to uh, to to live in a state where we have more taxpayers and not taxes. And in many instances, we have so many exemptions across the board that we're not collecting uh, nearly as much, and maybe we're paying more for something that we don't even use. So it's something to keep in mind. It's something that this committee might want to tackle in the future, look at maybe uh, why we've had so many exemptions over the years and whether or not it's worth lowering the 6.35% and incorporating uh, some of the exemptions that have been cut out of the budget uh, over time. Um, my question goes back to what Commissioner Bowen was talking about in telework. Um, so I also sit on the housing committee and there's been a lot of talk about renters coming in from New York. So we have a lot of folks that lived in New York City pre-pandemic. They've moved into lower Fairfield County, even up, you know, Route 8 into my area, greater Waterbury area. How do we know and how can we track who is working remote and necessarily not paying their fair share to the state of Connecticut. What what avenue do we have to make sure that we're capturing that income? Um, because again, someone who now lives here using our roads, using our services, living in the state of Connecticut, they should be paying taxes here so that the folks that have been here all along, you know, don't feel as if they're disproportionately affected by all these new residents. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Great question. Um, although I can't get into too much detail about how we we, we identify those uh, individuals who may have moved into Connecticut or who, who may uh, be spending time at their you know summer residence in Litchfield County somewhere and are, are still uh, working for an employer in New York. Um, I can assure you that we we do go to great lengths to identify any non-filer, uh, particularly with individual income tax. We have a very, very robust individual non-filer program that we run every year. And these are exactly the types of, of non-filers that we, we do pick up. Although I can't tell you how we do it, um, but, but I can assure you we do. Yep. I, I would just say you'd be amazed what people put on Facebook. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> And I'll just add one final statement that, you know, in being a, a millennial and someone who has many friends who've worked in New York City, some have moved back here. Um, you know, as we know, people make more money in New York City, right? They're making six figures. Six figures is is almost uh, not even enough to get by in New York City. But in Connecticut, you know, six figures, you're doing pretty well. So um, we don't we don't want to create an environment where someone's making that kind of money, but they don't step foot in New York City. Uh, and then they're using our resources here in Connecticut and they kind of get away while we're stuck putting the bill. So um, that's kind of a, been a priority of mine and I've been very interested in it. And I'm glad to hear that you're working on that and you have a, a task force or whatnot that's looking into it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative. Representative Bronco. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Commissioner and, and company. And uh, as a new legislator, uh, a lot of information was very helpful. So I appreciate the time uh, spending here with us. And uh, it's a lot to take in. So if you'll just help me understand, I think my question is easy. If you help me understand a little bit better, the pass through entity tax. Uh, <laughs> so when it when it was first implemented, it, it, it was started at that rate of 93 something. And was subsequently lowered to 80, 81. Uh, Okay, so the effect of that really is just a, a tax increase on a small business. Okay, um, so so the, the the point of lowering the rate was just to raise more revenue, essentially. I mean, it had budgetary implications. Sure, I mean, it, okay. would, it would spin off more cash. Absolutely. Okay. All right, uh, that that answers it. So I'm. Um, I guess I hope that we re restore that rate in '93. Thank you, Representative. I think we have covered the questions online and, and in the room. So I'm going to um, refer back to Representative Cheeseman for a follow-up. Thank you. One quick question. Um, given that federal law prohibits cannabis retailers from using federally insured banks, how do they remit money to DRS? Hello? Big bags of canvas bags that get dropped just kidding the, I, I i i think the best so let's see how the 
the the donut partners here punched it over this way. <laughs> That's here. our yeah. lawyer, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but the uh, I, I think the the way we we would uh, we would answer that is I think we'd look to what our our neighbors to the to North Massachusetts essentially when they were faced with it uh, struck. I don't want to say it was a deal, but their local um, sure. state chartered banks and state chartered credit unions stepped up and filled in the gap. And my understanding is that a similar sort of situation is at play here uh, in Connecticut. And I think if I can just add, I think what's important to remember is those uh, seven that opened on January 10th are a hybrid. So they've been operating, you know, using the medical, selling the medical cannabis to this point. So they've been, you know, used to, this, this isn't new for them. So they're they're using, um, but there's no tax on medical cannabis, right? But they've been using it. it it's it's they're, they're they have a banking infrastructure in place that they've been using is what I'm trying to say. So so it's not big bags. So no, we're not the, for providing no, no. for providing more work for Brinks in this state. I'm it's it, it's funny that you say that, Representative, because when Massachusetts first went down this road and and passed legalized uh, marijuana. They were they set up in their tax department a, a bank. They set up um, a secure location with a safe and 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 cashiers and and that type of thing because they thought that these businesses were going to bring in bags of cash, like you say. That never materialized because, like Lou mentioned, the state chartered credit unions, which are not prohibited by by federal law, were able to provide the banking infrastructure that they needed. Thank you. Always good to end a finance meeting and a conversation about big bags of cash. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, well done, Representative O'Day. <laughs> um, with that, I, I I thank you again for making yourselves available, and I, I'm sure there will be many follow up questions from from all of the various uh, legislators on the committee um, as we sort through all the things that lie ahead. Uh, I will note that we have uh, also have an informational. Um, forum on Friday, uh, the 27th at 11 a.m. with the controller's office. So um, hopefully we will also demystify another part of um, state government then. So thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of the day and drive safely. <laughs>